Look, I know all of you are probably exhausted from seeing the thousand things around ChatGPT and AI and automation. There's so much stuff out there and, and, and there's always a new article. So today I want to keep it pretty um, pretty low key, pretty summarized in the way. Not, not sort of, we're not going to be talking about things that are, hey, what's coming in five years? You know, I like to, when we're working with clients, it's, you know, what's reality? What can we do now with technology now that... Um, isn't going to break the bank and is a proven technology where we're not sort of like the bleeding edge where we're the guinea pigs in um, any situation that's that's coming in. So a bit about, uh, so today we'll, we'll look very, very high level on, on us. So a little bit about us for about a minute, that's all. I want to just do a real quick summary of sort of the areas around AI. AI is a very broad term, so I want to break it down. So that way when you've got IT people or people in your businesses trying to sort of like, Put a cloud over you of um, how technical it is to sort of break it down a little bit so we can understand that a little bit more. Um, I, I'm going to do the, the boring stuff where you would normally run, which is just very high level on governance risk and compliance around AI and automation as a whole. So actually putting that in the things that you should be thinking about from a framework and governance point of view, even before we worry about all the cool stuff. And once we've done that, let, let's talk about the cool stuff. Um, about areas in the business and and things and that aren't out of reach to do it. And I'll touch on success with automation. So these are sort of key steps that you can do um, to try and get the buy-in and ensure that you've got the best chance of a successful project, especially when we're talking about this sort of type of technology um, and where I've seen it sort of go bad. At any time, please put your Q&A or your, your questions in there. Um, I've done a job over the last long many years to to hire people much smarter than me. So if there's something I can't answer, um, I will certainly take it. And if I need to get any information, I'll get it back to you directly. Um, also today, all notes, all links, all references that I have behind the pretty slides, um, I actually provide that as part of them. So after this, when we, you want copies of this, you'll have all of my notes and I've got reference links on the back of this. So if you want to go and do any more reading on anything, um, there'll be a fair bit of content there for you to do so. So it's just sort of going looking looking for things. Okay. So um, very quick level about us. We were, um, our business was founded in 2016, uh, myself and a couple of business partners. You can probably guess that was done in Australia. Um, that's our head office uh, down there and um, flying in, flying out with other, other regions. Um, I have moved my family to here in Texas in February this year to, uh, permanently base myself and basically land and expand further the business into the US and uh, North America. So Australia, US, UK uh, traditionally, but we do have clients in well lots of other places. These days you can kind of do it from anywhere. Um, we're probably hitting around 50 knowledge workers, workers in the business um, dedicated to data. That's all we do is data, automation, integration, insights. Um, we have rolled out into more than 700 companies over 2016 to doing data insights. And when I talk about records and data and files and things, um, I asked someone the other day, I said, how much have we done it? And they just sort of came back to me and said, lots, hundreds of millions of records is what we have processed um, over that time. And that's really be building sort of data models and or data models and, and, you know, integration and processing around that especially in financial services and banking is where we've done a lot of work in. So let's break it down into um, a bit of a summary. And there's a lot more than this. These are sort of key areas where you'll bring things and technology into the business um, where people will talk about it. Now, AI, like I said, is a bit of an umbrella, right? These are the areas where traditionally a solution that's coming into your business will use one or a few of these different technologies to put that solution together. So that'll be just sort of do 30 seconds on each one. So then you kind of understand what we do. Now, machine learning is probably one of the biggest and easiest um, at this point in time. It's probably had the biggest investment or one of the biggest investments over the last few years um, to get data models and to be able to easily have your staff being able to train. Now, this is effectively providing a lot of data, existing documents, things that you have historically done, programmed in the system so we can start making decisions based on that historical data. So a good example would be like invoices processing. So, you know, if it's seen 500 of your supplier invoices and it knows where to get tax and different amounts and line items, 
and you put that into a machine learning model, the next time an invoice comes into the business, it understands it with a high accuracy as to what to do with that document. And that can be across any documents. Um, robotic process automation, that's pretty prevalent in manufacturing, especially when you're thinking about old legacy systems and the old green screens. This is, this is when we can't integrate into something and we basically need a robot to effectively screen scrape and emulate a human doing, you know, tab F1 and putting all the fields and data in for us because we can't integrate into the back end. Um, it's come down a lot in price. It's had a fairly high cost of ownership, but it's got a lot better than it was. Um, virtual agents, when someone says that, it's just a chat bot. You, I think nearly everyone's been on, on their app or somewhere or some website and something pops up and you think that it's Vivian talking to you, but it's just a chat bot, usually most of the time from decision tree. Uh, speech and image recognition, we're all used to Siri. You know, um, and image recognition is, um, is you know, obviously analysing images and, and visuals and facial uh, recognition. Also it comes into manufacturing. That sort of image recognition is now when we're starting to go in manufacturing and processing where we're looking at things and quality assurance as things are sort of going down the conveyor belt or, or other areas. I think we all know by sort of biometrics, fingerprint and, and, and visual and voice. Decision management, uh, that area is is been around for a long time. This is just a, a decision tree where the technology knows how to be able to make decisions and route itself down the line based on certain things that are occurring. Again, it, it's a it's a big part of sort of the AI models in being able to uh, make a decision on data that it's looking at. Um, natural language processing, um, the, you know, that's obviously when you're able to take human looking information and the computers are able to interpret that and make the queries and, and do the logic behind that. So customer service type thing, you know, like, you know, I'm really not happy with the service that I was given, being able to translate that into how that's going to sort of, um, you know, affect and what, what it will do with that by handing that over to a decision management and doing something. Um, deep learning platform, um, that is just really high level. That's ChatGPT. This is a very deep learning platform, a lot of data, millions, billions of records where we're able to use that almost like a neural network, like your brain to be able to sort of make um, make decisions on questioning. Cyber defense, that would be, a, I'm, I'm sure, Scott's uh, favorite topic. But that's one thing that's come out of AI very good is being able to do threat detection and do um, automation, a lot of that sort of cyber defense. And natural language generation is just the opposite of the processing where, where you've asked a question of, a, of the computer and rather than handing back zeros and ones and making no sense, it's effectively able to turn that back into human looking sort of language that, that sort of comes along. So that's high level. There is more. I've got links at the back of this, which will um, be able to provide you more information if you do want to be able to put yourself to sleep at night to be able to read more on that. But there's um, it's a bit there. But again, please ask any questions that you've got. Um, so well, let's just spend a couple of minutes on top questions for your leadership team to consider when we're looking at bringing in AI or automation into a business. So this is sort of horizontal. This is not specific to manufacturing. This is just when we start thinking about having Skynet effectively take over the business and be able to do. So um, general questions, uh, you know, there's employment, there's intellectual property, uh, there's privacy and cybersecurity questions that can be uh, can be asked, and I think that um, I, and again I, I, we won't spend too much time on it, but the key things to look at as far as general questions is you know so you've got you know many organisations distributing communications. Now the top things that you want to be able to think about, and just remember that all your data. Everything that you do and you hand over to your suppliers and vendors, there's a chance that they're using your data as well. And so you've got to be asking the questions when you've got these privacy agreements and you've got NDAs with your clients going, what are you doing with our data to build your data models? Because everyone's building data models based on their, their own data and their client's data. So it's kind of just questions to ask, you know, of your vendors using AI to analyze or modify it, you know, and you know, does your vendor agreement set limits on how they use that? Um, who are, what about the ownership rights? So who actually owns the data, the IP? Um, how do you verify the information? Everyone talks about sort of AI and automation skewing results, which it will, because it's only as good as the human that pro gave it the initial information to be able to build a model out of. So how do we test that? So sort of that quality assurance as well. Um, and where did you source it? There's more and more... 
uh, use cases coming out from privacy and IP where people are going, where did you build that model and get that data from? Do. Um, also, you know, developing in-house, is it third party? Do you have licensing rights out of there? And you've probably all heard about AI ethics. This is just the ethical and legal factors around how you're making decisions um, with that data. So around employment, um, high level, what workplace policies are in place? How are you using the AI? Are you making decisions? Um, you know, even from employee handbooks, you know, how are your employees actually you know, using things like ChatGPT, you know, have you got policies around that? And are they, you know, potentially putting your intellectual property into the public market? And I've seen really bad use cases of this where people have put R&D information into the public forum to ask for a summary to come back. Now, when they've done that, the keys are to the castle have been handed over. So all the information is now in public forum and anyone asked a question about that later on, it can. Now, there are ways to be able to make that private. So, again, I'm happy to answer questions on that. Um, and what measures can you take to proactively avoid, you know, AI creating liabilities? And, again, there's just, a, you know, a compliance framework behind that that you can do. IP, again, what was the source of the data, um, you know, for your internal teams or service providers to use and train the systems to be able to use in the business? And does your AI or your automation, does it comply with applicable privacy laws? Now, depending how you manufacture and if you've got, you know, your business has, you know, different states or even different countries in the way that you handle data and you've got employees and, and, and supplier records, there are privacy laws in how you handle that data. So I'm sure you've got people in the businesses to do more on that, but it's just something to sort of keep front of mind as well. And very last one, uh, privacy. Oh, I've got privacy and then cybersecurity. But privacy, again, like I said, what was the source of the data? And do you apply the applicable uh, privacy laws around there? And it's got your one, cybersecurity, obviously. Um, you know, are there policies to prevent your company's confidential information going out in the first place? Have you, have you educated the business and the staff on what they can and can't do? And what are the potential cybersecurity threats by the more integration, the more things that we talk to outside, the more that we're integrating with data from external sources, we're opening up those cybersecurity um, holes as well. So there's a lot there, I know, um, but the way I treat it is I've got a really easy sort of little picture um, to run on is if you've got people in the business wanting to do it or they come to you and, hey, we're looking at investing into technology and we want to be able to do AI or they're even talking about chat GPT for certain things to be able to do with that. This is probably the picture that I stick to is, is, is basically almost convert this to a table. Now, if someone's got a use case that they want to do something with anything to do with automation, they need to be able to answer all these questions. You know, can they explain how they, how it works? Can they monitor it and measure it to make sure that it's doing what it's meant to be doing and not just running off to do its own thing? Um, can it be reproduced? So was it a one-off thing that they did? Is it actually programmed and has, has been able to test? Is it secure? Is it human cent Is it human centered? And by that, I mean it, all automation, the way that we treat it when we work with clients is not to run off and automate for the sake of it and leave the humans alone, is to always have the humans involved for critical thinking. The whole idea here is that we're removing humans and your workers from doing the menial tasks you know, get them doing smarter things in the business, making smart decisions and critical decisions in the business. Um, is it unbiased? That's going to tick sort of the ethics. Um, and is it justifiable? I've seen so many vanity projects where people want to run off and automate something and spend a lot of money and it's a one percenter. It's going to save such, such a low ROI to the business. It's kind of like, well, I read it on Google and my friend in the other business did it and we're going to run off and do automation. Sometimes just just justify, old, old school, justify the, so the ROI of where that where that sits. So, um, I said, any questions on, on that or put them in? I'm now we can we can jump into some fun stuff and, and talk about areas of the business that we can get value in automation. I know we sort of rushed through that a little bit, but um, I'm happy to stop here if you want to be able to do a little bit of Q and A, or we can we can push through towards the end and and get into it if you like. Shane, I have a question. If it's okay, mm -hmm. okay. <clears throat> Now, and I know companies like Walmart and others, because I've been monitoring this 
pretty regularly. They had an internal LLM for use for their employees mm -hmm. so that they can get familiar with this. My only concern with what you have here, which is some level of control, if you want to think of the Tesla paradigm and they had the self-drive feature, there will be people who use it irresponsibly, read a book or watch a movie, and then it sometimes ends in a car crash. Mm -hmm. So if a company were to enforce safeguards on how the LLM should be used, let's just say they do it, would that impact the flexibility and the knowledge learning capabilities in the LLM? Thank you. Um, it, it depends on the, I can answer this in two different ways. Um, we've got clients that we build LLMs for traditionally instead of, you know, banking, insurance, financial services. Um, now they actually worked out by program, adding too much data and external data, it actually made their model stupid because they were putting too much data into it rather than actually their own data. And they went, oh, we'll go and grab everything. We'll do a base LLM and we'll, we'll do it. So you can put guardrails in. You can put, and we go back to the ethics and the rest. And usually the guardrails are around the main things is, are we going to infringe on IP? Are there problems? Do we have security issues? And they're probably your, your primary ones and, and your ethics, in other words, is the decision management that's going to be made based on skewed data. So do I have a wide range of data or have I just taken a subset that happens to lean towards a certain decision which wouldn't normally be done by a human? So it is it, it, as long as we go through the framework and we've got a really wide range of data in that LLM, I don't think you've got necessarily a problem, but you really do need to scope I suppose I always have the question and the answer is, that, what does success look like? Why are we building this LLM? What information are we trying to get out of it? You know, what's, what's it trying to analytics and insights? Is it going to give us and save us time in the business? And, are you know, you're putting one year, three year, five or 20 years worth of data mm -hmm. in that LLM. Um, but um, look, I'm happy to, yeah, the, yeah, send me argue your details. I like to get into these conversations and sort of specific sort of examples because I've got good and the bad and the ugly, I suppose, of where where this has gone with some clients. And we, but we do have find some that it can do it at a reasonable cost because if you go down a path and go down a really big path, this can cost millions to do if you do it wrong, right? But you know, and most businesses aren't in that framework now. Walmart's is you know they've got more money than God, so they can afford to sort of run off and do these things. Whereas most businesses uh, want to be able to do these things for the sort of the tens of thousands of dollars, not the millions of dollars, and how we're able to do it. So there are ways to do that. So I'm I'm happy to um, get in that a little bit further too. Another. Um, all right, now that you'll have this one as well. Let's let's talk high level about some areas in the business. Now, this is not just to manufacturing, but this is just sort of key areas that we have seen automation work. Um, I've broken it up a little bit, and then we can talk through um, some typical use cases that I've seen um, in that. So let's look at high level departments in the business. So we've got finance and accounting, we've got HR, we've got legal and compliance, you know, the, the whole procurement supply chain, quality control, operations, production, customer service, audit and compliance, R&D, maintenance and repair, and transport, logistics, and warehousing. Obviously, that's a big part too. And there's a lot of subset sort of categories that go underneath these areas. So when I look at these and when I talk with our team as well and we talk with clients, I go, these, these are real use cases. They're not sort of pine sky 2026 type use cases. It's all coming. These are areas where you've got uh, staff, you've got knowledge workers, uh, you've got inefficient, typical inefficient processes where it can easily and, you know, from a commercial point of view, easily be able to do integration or use AI or automation to do it. So you've probably got, you know, look, thinking about systems and people always go, oh, what about that? Oh, I've got a system, we'll kind of do all of this itself. You know, you might have systems like Infor or Dynamics, uh, SAP, Oracle, Acumatica, Epicor, SysPro. I'm sure a few of you have probably been across plenty of these ones. Um, it is correct. A lot of these systems are coming out with automation tools in specific areas. But I think we've all experienced that as soon as you say the word customization in one of those ERPs, it's a really big check and usually very difficult downstream when you want to be able to do upgrades or certain, do certain things. So 
we usually work with clients to sort of counsel and they go, there's a certain point in which you take a module out of the box where a system can do it. And there's a certain level where you go, I'm going to put a process automation framework in that's agnostic. In other words, you have control over that to sort of very easily and cheaply do customization, but it will link and talk to those various systems in the business as needed to be able to get analytics, to be able to sync information, be able to do it. It's the cheapest way of doing it than necessarily doing customization in, in ERP. So um, typical questions I would be asking when I'm looking at doing automation, like is I was, how do we know we should automate an area in the first place? All right, so ROI in these use area, uh, yeah, these areas, you know, I just say, am I going to get ROI back in 12 months? You know, is it, no, no, I don't want to be going, oh, we're going to have money back, at, you know, in this in five years time, things change in a business. We want to be able to have tangible ROI in 12 months. You know, can the projects, the, the size of the projects being delivered in three to six months, not two year projects. We can take bite-sized pieces in department level and be able to deliver them in three to six months and, and, and obviously provide that, that ROI. Um, and so the questions to look at, um, you, you know, if you have two or more people in a department and you're, they're looking to, they need to hire someone else because everyone's screaming that they're strained and they're working too hard, it's an obvious area to automate. There will be ROI because any of these process automation areas will hand back a you know at least 20, 30% and sometimes more time for each employee in that area. So you will free up the equivalent to take on more work before you need to hire. And that's sort of the idea is when I think we're all looking at the, the, the bottom line is how do we increase revenue and not match that with operational costs because we're just throwing bodies at the problem to make it go away. So how do we automate to do that? Um, you know, if you're about to hire someone additional because of growth, you would automate. You know, if your staff attrition in your business is higher than 4%, the national average is about 3.8. If it's higher than 4% and going a lot higher than 4%, there is a reason why you're rolling over your staff. It's usually because either overworked, I hate the process, or that there's something there. And there are ways to be able to streamline and then sort of look at that attrition because we all know the cost of re-employing and replacing staff. So the more we don't do that, the better we are. Um, and I guess also look at from a commercial point is most of these areas can be automated for the foul, you know, in the thousands per month, not in the tens of thousands or more per month. These are sort of when we're starting to the simple areas. So look, some key examples um, for, um, for some of these. So in finance accounting, a lot of you have probably done invoice processing or invoice automation, but you've got purchase order matching, you know, you've got financial reporting, which is a big one. How do we bring data in from multiple sources and have active live data, not reactive? We've done the end of month uh, runs and we've put the reports together and it's already 30 days old and we're making decisions on stale data. You know, we were able to bring that in. Uh, human resources, employee onboarding, simple one, you know, work workforce management as well. So that could be contractors, that certifications, all the things that you potentially got some compliance issues around. Um, Legal and compliance, I would be looking at contract management, uh, regulatory compliance, depending on what you do, and what the business is making, be able to automate the capture of that information and be able to report on that in traffic light if there's any, any issues. Um, procurement and supply chain, okay? purchase order automation, vendor management, being able to manage those, uh, those, those vendors, go to market, not have those evergreen contracts that sort of roll over um, rather than having the system sort of automate that for you. And, th and then you're getting things like quality control. So quality assurance documentation, you've got audit trail management, um, you know, you know, operations and production. We look at things like inventory management, production scheduling. And I don't know if any of you have touched into digital twins yet, but this is something that's coming into some of the manufacturing industry around digital twins. Effectively, we're creating a digital representation of your physical business. And it's able to start making decisions and analyze things down to it could be packaging, it could be rebuilding, it could be new tools, and you're kind of being able to make AI to use some decision before you run off and do the tooling and build something. Um, a bit of anyone wants to um, dig into that a little bit more. It's pretty cool stuff. Um, customer service support, again, customer inquiries, product warranty management. A lot of this information coming in can be extracted from emails, from online, and they're using those decision trees to be able to do and automate some of the decisions but also things like 
we've seen eight of the same problem that day. So rather than finding out about that a couple of months down the track that there's a problem with something, AI goes, hey, there's eight, eight of the same issue today. Let's notify, let's stop, let's look at something before we keep uh, burning money potentially on a problem. So we will do that. Um, R&D, that's research document analysis, maybe not so um, relevant for you, but um, if you do see it. Um, maintenance repair, that's like equipment maintenance, spare parts management. And where I see a lot of money being saved and a lot of really cool stuff is in transport logistics and warehousing. That's a very broad area. But you know things like IoT, so the Internet of Things and sensors on devices and sensors on operational equipment, even now sensors on people on wearables, people looking at work, you know, work, health and safety uh, type stuff. Um, route optimization. If you've got vehicles or you're dealing with logistics in that way, route optimization, um, you know, demand forecasting, inventory management, shipment tracking, um, warehouse management, supplier collaboration, risk management, and you'd have predictive analytics. And there's probably a, a lot, a lot more there as, uh, as well. Um, that's high level. I'm now like I want to sort of open it up and you know be interesting to know if you've had any experience um, with this and I, I think I can then we can talk to success with AI where we've seen things how they've been successful and I usually talk to sort of this framework which is generally how we treat it when we're sort of going to break it down and someone's coming to you and going I want to go and invest a lot of money into automating in an area and they're asking for a really big fat check to get into that because the vendor has come in and convinced them that they need to go and spend a quarter of a million dollars to do something. Um, first of all, is the obvious stuff is define the specific problem. You know, so I say identify the specific problem that the AI or the machine learning or whatever tool set that it's going to be uh, to do. So we want to make sure that we're looking at the people, the process, you know, so I would, I, this is what I suggest most clients do discovery. Even if it's with a vendor, and even if it's paid discovery, actually doing good documented discovery on a process mapping, because it's up to the vendor and any and a good partner to question your process. You know, are you just digitizing a really bad process? Because that'll just cost you money, and that and we and we see that a lot. Um, so sometimes it's technology will go well. I don't need to do twenty steps to do this. I only need to do six now because I can now talk to all of your systems to make decisions uh, on that. Um, collect data. So when we go, okay, we've, we've, we've mapped it out, we're going to move ahead um, with that. So I would collect the data, high quality data that can be used for it. And again, widespread data, a really good example and spread of, you know, small customers, big customers, you know, or any, any sort of different decisions that have been made in that specific area that you're going to do. And there are ways to be able to actually hand data into automation and AI, and it will make a decision on what is the best data set to use. It'll go, this is the biggest spread that I've got. This will give me the best um, you know, model in way I can be able to make, make decisions. Building a team. Now, this is the hard one, right, around, around this thing. So building a team with the necessary skills to develop and deploy automation. And very often people are scared thinking, I don't have the workers that understand AI. And a lot of the time you don't. Some of the stuff's very simple and there's sort of baby steps where, your staff can be uh, brought into that system. But we all know that the biggest killer is the staff when we're trying to do a project in the first place. So this is where I kind of could refer to, um, you know, if you've got long-term workers or people that have been involved projects or, you know, they sort of breathe in heavily when you're about to do something in the business, you know, I usually call them sort of the Karens and Kens. So I apologize if anyone's on this call, it's Karen or a Ken, but I say, bring them into the, bring them into the fold early. So part of that discovery process, make them own it, provide a bit of information. And that's where success will lead to as we're trying to roll this out into, into the business. Um, choosing the right tools. This can be hard. We've all been burnt by putting in where we think we've got the right partner, the right technology, and 12 months down the track, it's not right. If you're going to invest in quite a large project, um, don't necessarily belt the vendor over the head to sort of go, give us a free trial or a free POC because it's going to be done in a way that either works to their benefit or you're going to find out about the, the, the skeletons later on. I would consider doing POCs, right? Do those proof of concepts, but do a paid proof of concept. And that might be small. It could be a ten dollars or $20,000 investment, depending on the size of the project. And don't think of it if the POC fails that we've lost ten dollars or twenty grand. 
I would be thinking that I've saved two hundred and thirty thousand dollars of a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar project because it was wrong to do. We've tested it, we've looked at, we've done the iterations of that um, to do. Most most of the time it will work, but also what the POC allows you to do is absolutely integrate with that vendor and make sure that culturally you match uh, for the long term and the product really is what they say on the cereal box of what it's going to do. Uh, you're successful around that one. Start small. Do not do whole of business in automation um, because by the time you get there, things change in business. Choose a department, choose a specific problem, choose something that's got good ROI so the business and all the stakeholders buy in from the first one. They go, it worked, staff are reasonably happy or got there um, and it actually is starting to, we're seeing tangible ROI and what it's providing the business. Then other stakeholders and department heads will jump on board. They'll go, I want to go next rather than you've, you're trying to work with six departments at the same time. Usually that, that's like herding cats in the first place into a room to make a decision. Um, so I would work on that way. Monitor and measure results. If you don't have, you know, what does success look like? And you, if you can't answer that question in the very first document before you start, how do you know it's successful in what we're doing? So make sure you've got those guardrails in there of we are monitoring. And we need to know at a certain point in time when to pull the pin. We're not meeting, it's like our child, we hold on to the projects, we let it go too long, we've spent another 50 grand in six months than we should have. If we're not meeting those baselines and those benchmarks along the way, just kill it. Go to another, go down another path or another path that we discussed and we go down, but we've saved a lot of time in the business by doing that. And we get to the end, it all worked, everyone's happy. Obviously we scale up. So we've started really small. We've done those POCs. It was successful. We now onboard more people. So you might have only had five or so staff or something involved early on. Once you've got that and they are now the sponsors in the business, they enjoyed, they were part of that journey. Make sure you choose the right people to do that too. Um, then you can do scale up. You can push it out to the business to be able to do, to do more. And that's where we've usually seen success in those areas. So... Um, I'm happy to go into any of these areas in more detail, talk about some examples, or you give me some examples that you've that you've had pain with, or you've even sort of looked at and you're not sure. I said, I'm happy to find we've got a lot of information in certain areas, and I'm happy to provide use cases on where we've seen the pros and cons of that from historical, uh, historical clients. So if you want any information, um, it's my LinkedIn, my my email uh, is there as well. Feel free. I'm more than happy to jump. If you're in, if you're in near Dallas, I'm easily bribed with coffee or lunch to talk over anything. And if you're not, I'm happy to jump on Teams or Zoom and you know talk through anything for half an hour. Even if you sort of got some projects on the go and you kind of think it's on the edge of, and you know just want some some advice, I'm more than happy to do that or um, and provide that as well. Could you walk us through a um or case study or just an example on um, let's call it the finance side or the HR side or something that would be short enough to go through of mm -hmm. what a, a project along these lines where there was a, be a defined beginning, a defined what got changed and then kind of like the end game. Yep. Yep. I think, I think an easy one in finance um, I think would be something let's, let's choose a simple one. You know, this, and this can go in any business, but especially, you know, in your factory, we've got a lot of supplies. Let's talk about accounts payable and accounts receivable automation. Simple use case, right? So we've got a team of people in the accounts payable team or AR team in the business. Traditionally, we've got the system, the ERP or the accounting package that's holding the general ledger. We've got invoices coming in multiple streams. It could be mailboxes. It could be certain areas. And people are effectively manually processing those invoices and probably manually getting them emailed and emailing people within the business to get approvals to pay them in the first place, you know, or I've done purchase orders in the business. So a use case would be, and this is probably one of the highest ROI areas if you have not automated this area in, in, in the finance and accounting, is invoices can now come in because we've got a data model. It understands every area. Traditionally, technology has required you to program Where's the tax? Where's the thing? At a supplier level, every single supplier, I've had to program the page basically into the system. That doesn't, that's not required anymore. You could effectively go, here's 500 uh, historical supplier invoices, feed it into the system. 
it will analyze all of it. And based on that, we'll build a model and, and probably be in the very high 90% of now being able to extract information from those invoices. If it was a purchase order aligned to it, it will go and look up a purchase order number. It will check that everything matches. If it doesn't, it'll push it to the side for exception handling. If it does match, it knows the general ledger. It knows where to, to do it for approvals. It'll effectively post it. It's now eliminated the human doing any processing. And the typical sort of range is $15 to $30 per invoice in a business to sort of process in the cost of doing that. You're now getting it down into the, sort of the dollars you know, rather than this 15 to, to, to 30. And when you're sort of looking at all in, um, and you can take that multiple steps. So, you know, we're even talking about line line level extraction. We're looking at backwards, looking at products and line item extraction on those invoices now to be able to post those into the systems, uh, put stock, you know, check your warehouse, do stock receipt and sort of run that whole uh, uh, whole process as you've got incoming incoming invoice and warehouse uh, sort of stuff. Um, that's a very, very common area that people will attack. Sometimes they've tried it with the ERP and the ERP had some ingestion or capture, but it didn't have a very good approval process or integration into other areas of the business to do the, the validation, or they didn't have the integration into additional systems to be able to do checks and balances. And where we spend the time now is getting that integration done, because we can, even if they say you can't have an API and you can't talk to the back end, there is always ways to be able to access the information and do data validation. But that will typically, that area will typically free up 50% of that department automating that area. If you were to kind of split that up between, like if you were just take a, a three year ago or a five year ago AP automation, as opposed to your current AP automation together with AI, right? Let's mm -hmm. just kind of differentiate those two. How much of that is coming from just the AP automation and how much of that is coming from the AI component where you actually... Because the the feeding it in and having it understand quickly like what where things need to go, especially on the startup, yeah, that's that's wonderful. But once it gets going, is it how much more efficient is it than just the regular AP automation in your in your opinion? Well, traditional AP automation, the old sort of OCR and regular expression to get technical on it is a lot of the time that cost of ownership was if I brought on a new supplier, someone was programming the new invoice. We don't do that anymore. So as new suppliers, as new features come in, um, and the models used to be difficult in the way that, say, there was an additional line item or there was some feature on that invoice that you know that you wanted to be able to go, actually now we now need to capture that. We never used to. We never used to do the line items, or we never used to do something in historically how we used to process. Um, you would go back and do a lot of retro fitting of what you had programmed with historical. Whereas now I would go, I'm going to add the field, I've got the baseline documents, I'd probably get through it in a couple of hours, redeploy the model, I'm good to go the next day with it. So the cost of total cost of ownership now, when we need to change or make changes is a lot cheaper than historically we had the models that we kind of programmed the sheets and then we might've had robotic process automation that was programmed and now it's got something else in the process in there as well and now it breaks. Because it now yeah, you had to, to teach it all the mapping previously, and now this is kind of doing the mapping That's for it. you without having to perpetually keep on having to update the mapping. That's it. So that's that's why it's a very quick win as well. So traditionally, someone go, oh, we're going to spend a lot of time. We've got two thousand suppliers. You know, if you've got a huge supply, if you've only got a few suppliers, not so bad. But if you've got hundreds and hundreds of suppliers, the time that it used to take and the cost of getting the project up and running just for something simple like AP was months because people would be programming invoices and testing. Whereas we go, guys, just go into the system for the last two months, export the data, let's run it through the engine. We'll map the 10 fields or 20 fields, process, deploy, model. That's a lot cheaper to be able to do uh, to do that over time. So that's that's a typical one um, for a AP. Um, contract management, you know, again, there's auto automation versus AI. And again, AI is a term, but most of it is just programmed language or something programmed in a process sitting underneath that. You know, AI might be doing some decisions on sort of data or we're looking at content to make some decisions, but we've still usually got a decision tree and we've got some other programming in there. So contract management, uh, contractors management uh, there as well. Uh, if you've got a lot of sort of third party and contractors and you've got that compliance issue around certifications and managing that 
uh, very easy way to go, you know, they're about to send a job. Someone's about to allocate a job to someone who's, a, you know, a plumber out in the middle of nowhere because they know him as a mate out there. We go, no, actually, you know, their certifications run out, their driver's license is up to date. So the system starts doing things like chasing them to be able to get those that information, upload that information, but extract the information off the images and populate that back in the system so someone's not doing the data entry on that and potentially even doing fraud checks by now taking that information and checking with a third party going, is this valid, what I've been given? You know, so things like that. And that could be any, again, any process where we're dealing with third party or validating with an additional system. I could have a CRM versus the ERP versus another system in the business. We can now take metadata or specific key fields off anything and go and look in different areas to do. Let's see, I'll see if there's any questions here. Is that decision trend presentation deposition system? Yeah. And uh, Shane, can I jump off what Robert just asked? Um, so let's just pretend that you're like a dog whisperer and we're talking, we're talking with training Rex. So I'm I'd love to sit on the couch, have Rex bring the newspaper and a cup of coffee. We're going to train a dog to do a cup of coffee. So mm -hmm. now in the same paradigm, if let's just say um I'm joining a new company and says, look, I talked to this guy called Shane. He says it's almost commercial off the shelf kind of situation. So if let's just say my boss were to say, okay, hey, start to finish, uh, how well defined is it? Let's just say we're talking about logistics and warehousing and such. So let's just say you are the dog trainer. Rex is the LLM. Is, mm -hmm. is it all relatively well defined where we can say within three months, we can get something somewhat trained and within 12 months, we actually have a system that's up and running. Is it that rinse and repeat right now or are we getting there? Sure. Uh, look, again, um, depending on the specific use case, but I've got clients who will have data models and I talk about machine learning data models too here. Like there's different than LLMs because everyone's talking about LLMs, but I would say a higher than 90% of the time, the business does not require an LLM. It requires a data warehouse with predefined information and machine learning models and data types associated to that. It's a lot cheaper than a true LLM. I'd be like, going, depends what you're trying, what questions and what queries do you need to get out of this? Because like I said, I showed you those little, one of those little pictures underneath the AI umbrella. Having the large language model, the LLM in there, um, you know, this this can be used for things like, yes, predictive analytics and, I, and I, if I was in banking, financial services, insurance or specific industries, it makes sense. Uh, but again, what are you trying to get out of it before we go to the expense of an LLM? Because an LLM is not cheap, mm -hmm. right? doesn't matter how you look at it. Right? You're either using public forum data, again, why? Unless you're in certain job roles in the business like HR or others, and you're asking it to help you do your day-to-day -day job. That's not specifically around the manufacturing and data on our clients, but more, I'm just trying to speed up my job because I'm writing writing documents and proposals and quotes and sales forecasting or whatever it might be uh, in there. So that's when I say, um, when we know exactly what the issue is, we sort of dumb it down and go, let's not go to the most expensive bleeding edge area where we're going to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right, because LLM is easy to feed the data. It's the actual processing of it, the cost, the actual compute cost to be able to do that. Now, there are ones off the shelf and you can now do them on-prem and put them in your own environment. You don't have to necessarily use the open AI and, and others out there uh, or Microsoft and, and co-pilot and sort of their versions when that's coming out in 2024. You can download and you can get copies to be able to run, but you're still by the time you do hardware and that you're still in the hundreds of thousands of dollars by the time you're, you're talking about doing this. So again, question what the outcome is. What are we trying to do? Do we do a data warehouse instead? Feed a million records into a data warehouse. You could do a data warehouse cheap, feed a hundred million records into that, and still put a chat style framework over the top that can effectively convert that warehouse or SQL server database into a framework where you can still do the same things as if you're in the old chat GPT. You can still, it can still look and still make sense of the data that you've got in the database that you've got existing in all of your systems now. You can bring that in, suck that data database into sort of a framework that sort of sits over the top of all of your existing data structures to do, much cheaper to do. 
Can you go back to the slide that has the uh, various components? It's almost like departments of the organization. Mm -hmm. This one? Yeah, so you did mention, I thought the AP was a good example on the finance and uh, accounting side. Um, if you were to take, not to like play, you know, Trump the professor, but uh, if you were to take quality control, is there a use case that you can kind of walk through on that? Yeah, I think quality control, there's a really good use case. Oh, look, I've had this for someone where they were doing, brought it in for manufacturing. It was actually image processing. So we talk about that uh, data processing and voice processing. That was actually image processing where they were using the image processing on the manufacturing, sort of the conveyor belt style thing where it was using AI to determine um, the quality control on the, on, the, on the manufacturing, on the pieces it was doing, running down the conveyor belt a lot faster than a human could ever do. Right? It's basically processing images at the millisecond. And then based on that, the conveyor belt's effectively flicking things off the off the line because it has determined that that, that is faulty or not meeting quality control. And, and similar just taking the historical images, looking at it, yes, learning like what the defects are and then following that pattern. Correct. Mm -hmm. Right. So quality control. So quality control short. Um so, you know, and then you've got reporting and documentation. So by doing that, it's sort of going, what's our failure rate? What's our wastage rate? We're sort of, sort of getting into those things as we manufacture. Um, what was another one? I think it was audit trail. So yeah, definitely had the computer vision based quality control. That was that was a, a big one in the quality control. I know that one came up with, I asked one of my guys uh, yesterday um, where they did it. And then feeding all of that information into the warehouse to do, uh, predictive analytics and effectively looking at going, is there a fault in what we're actually building and manufacturing and why is the wastage and the percentages and loss so high? Um, and it was you know, maintaining comprehensive audit trails of that as well, of the quality control, the processes, the inspection. So we're starting to now look through where did this go back from? So where did, where's the bottleneck? Where's the problem that's causing this in this whole sort of um, building and supply chain of there? Have you seen anything like on the training side where, or call it uh, a little bit different than quality control where they're kind of, it's creating the processes like where it can, let's say I, watch five reps that are like, you've got customer service on here, like watch five customer service reps, watch what they're going through to process orders or whatever it might be and learn that and actually start kicking out little manuals on best practices and things like that. Have you seen anything yep. along those lines? Yeah, so you're 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 effectively creating um, base process mapping, and you're trying to automate process mapping. Now, what now where that feeds off to as well is when people are going, I want to do process mapping by almost a day in the life of, you know, how do we actually currently do something? That also helps when you're starting to build out and not spend so much time doing things like the de what would have been decision trees, decision management, and starting to build that into the framework where we go, I don't want to sit here and necessarily have to manually go. Let's do step by step a thousand times and how we do something. Let the process map and AI start going. I'm going to make assumptions on this because I'm getting from A to B. I think I know I've worked out what you know the few few steps in the middle are to do that and start aligning that and building out decision trees. I've seen that uh, getting done. Definitely automating process mapping because, but again, a lot of this stuff has been done manually most of the stuff in these tools is you know this this is data that's been done manually over the last you know 5 10 20 years and, and just been digitized with millions of records to make assumptions with and that's where we talk about data types as well the reason the information is getting so quick and so good and accurate is because we're now able to look at think about name entity recognition and natural language processing i'm now looking at not the old day of going, I'm making a decision on a, on, a, on a character. I'm now looking at a sentence. I'm looking at sentiment in in a piece of information to make decisions on that like a human would. Not whereas traditionally programming, computer programming was, uh, I only understand that word. And then someone's programmed me to understand that word plus that word. What, is that, what does that query mean? So you are starting to automate a lot of that more. So it's just quick, a quicker to deploy effectively a lot of this stuff. And maybe it's going to be a shameless plug, but when when I'm assuming that you're this is what you're doing, right? So like what when do you get when do you get called <laughs> typically? Like like what are your typical projects? Like when are you getting called in? And then how does that all how does that all work? I think um well we there's another area as well. We get brought into a lot when there's basically chaos. 
right? When there's data, data, data chaos, you know, um, process, you know, where people are sort of, you know, they've definitely got systems that aren't talking. We look at manual processes occurring. We look at high level of manual processing in the business uh, in certain areas. Or, and when we're getting into the sort of the governance risk compliance around the data itself, we go, we've got multiple repositories of data. We don't necessarily look comfortable with the security of it and how we're sharing it and how we're interacting with it. We're able to put our tools in. The first thing we can do is we can put our tools in, find every piece of data that exists in the business. You know, so the typical, a typical piece of information exists 19 times in a business. So there's like 18 copies of something that's usually sifting around somewhere. So first of all, let's go find it all. Let's go look in the databases, the file servers, the SharePoints, the ERPs, the exchange servers, you know, and go, let's understand what the data looks like in our business and where the danger is potentially. Then we put frameworks in to take control of that. So we go, okay, if we see data with things like social security numbers or health information or information that should not be freely available, we can quickly put rules over that and do um, you know, compl- you know, quarantine and sort of um, remediation of that. Then we get into the cool stuff around the workflow automation. So that's definitely when we're getting into, we will look at, we would have done projects in probably, probably all these areas. Really, when I talk to the guys, got asked what's sort of the key areas and different, different verticals, not just manufacturing, but you'll have multiple verticals. Like I just mentioned before, we get construction and healthcare and finance and banking and huge volumes, but Typically, it's very similar. It doesn't matter on the vertical uh, or the business. The, the, the issues are very similar. It's more people than we should have, throwing people at the problem rather than looking at the, the base um, and cleaning up the data because also the, the biggest cost to a business is bad data. We have data discrepancies. We've got simple one from a customer service point of view is, uh, you know, mm-hmm. Shane exists in three systems in the business, three different addresses, which is the source of truth. So we can start linking up systems. So we go, what's the source of truth in the business? Prioritize that. So if something changes in the business, we know to run off to all systems and update that to make sure that we've got consistency across the business. So when we start reporting on that predictive analytics and we start doing things, um, we're doing it with correct data. Because at the moment, like we're talking about LLMs and things before, people are feeding terrible data into these data models. So they're making decisions on things that we go, that's why these things are getting stupid because they're not starting with a clean data set to do that. And that's what we'll do. Well, so first thing we do is go, let's clean it first, guys. Don't run off and do all the cool stuff and spend all this money. Let's do some things that do not cost a lot of money. Let's clean the data. We don't need to look to A to Z because people you will go, oh, we can't automate until we look at it all and work out where the problems are. I go, let's just analyze and highlight the problems and leave the other 95% that's okay, quarantine the bad data, clean it up, and over a period of time, it would happen. And we're not talking years. You know, Some of these exercises can be done within months to be able to do it. Um, so Shane, if to, I can yeah. just jump in here, because um, we do like to keep these kind of at the, the hour mark, and I just wanted Done. to jump in and uh, give, you, give you a chance to maybe put your, your contact information slide up again. Um, I hope I'm speaking for people, but I'll, I'll let uh, everybody, you know, contact you and, and give comments. But I, I want to say I really enjoyed the presentation. I, I appreciated you putting together, I think, a lot of concepts that maybe a lot of us have heard into one mm. kind of solid, concise package that really, really um, kind of s- spoke to me. So appreciate the time here. Um, and and um, how would you like people to to get a hold of you best? Uh, email, email, is it your LinkedIn? Is it- yeah, email my LinkedIn. Like I said, I'm I'm you know I'm I'm in the ground. I'm it's great meeting meeting people since I've moved to the states. I'm here for the good, and um, it's really good just growing my network and learning more. I mean, I, I'd love to even just hear about your issues that you've got, so I I understand more that's going on in the market as well from your point of view with the frustrations out there, and that's how we that's how we just get better. Awesome. Well, again, I appreciate it. I've, I've even gotten a few, you know, private messages, uh, you know, th- saying, you know, awesome presenters. So I just wanted to share that kind of at the end here. So thanks again, thanks. Shane. Thank you, everybody <laughs> else who's joined and appreciate the attendance. And like I said, uh, follow up with Shane. Seems like he's got some some cool stuff that could probably help out a lot of us. So thank you. And um, hope everybody has a good evening. All right. Thanks, guys. Good to meet you.